Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, non-binary, distinguished guests, welcome to Ridiculous, the Life of a Clown. Hello, Mr. Iverson. Welcome to Ridiculous Life of a Clown. Um, please tell everyone who you are and what you do. Well, I'm honored to be here on the Ridiculous Life of a Clown. Uh, unfortunately for all you wonderful clown fans, I'm not a clown. I'm the guy who uh, runs around in a top hat with a big voice. That is, I am the ringmaster. Most people know me now as the last ringmaster of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, the greatest show on earth. And so now I sit on the board of a wonderful new show and company, Omnium, a brave, new, a bold new circus, pardon me. Omnium, a bold new circus, and I also ringmaster for them as well. That's amazing. Um, so I guess we should go back to the beginning of your career as a ringmaster. What brought you to being a ringmaster in the first place? A happy accident brought me to uh, <laughs> being a ringmaster, really. Uh, like so many people, you're uh, trying to find your way in multiple, uh, well, in different uh, uh, places in the performing arts. Mine was opera. I just graduated from the Hart School of Music of the University of Hartford, and um, I was really readying myself to venture off to Europe to study and to continue to grow in that. And uh, upon my bouncing around from here to there in audition after audition, I happened into an audition for a dinner theater. Uh, it was the Fireside Dinner Theater's Christmas show, Fireside Dinner Theater, family-owned theater out there in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. I auditioned in New York City, and it so happened that uh, the director, Phil McKinley, uh, was also directing and in search of a ringmaster for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. So it was one of those being in the right place at the right time types of scenarios. And uh, for me, it, it worked out well. However, understand it was a rigorous uh, audition process. Uh, they didn't just hand it, on to me, hand it to me on a silver platter. Um, they called me first, thought I would be uh, a good fit for it. I was up against about 30 other candidates, and um, I had about three auditions, and the rest is history. That's amazing. So um, how old are you when that happened? I was, uh, I was a young, good-looking 22. 22. And if I'm not confused, that makes you the youngest ringmaster for Ringling at that point? Yes. Or, yes, or ever, I guess. Well, in Ringling's history, as far as I'm, I know, yes. That's, that's amazing. So you were, you were aiming at opera and, and um, building your voice and building your tool. Um, uh, how does, how does, what's integral to the work of a ringmaster? What, what is at the core of, of what you do? Well, in my opinion, it all starts with the voice. Um, and, of course, you fill that up with presence. Uh, I think you have to have some sort of stately stature. Um, because, you know, even if you don't own the show, uh, as some ringmasters do, the audience has a just they just have an un, um, uh, this uh, uncanny uh, relation to you where they believe you are the, the ultimate authority. And um, it's sort of this interesting relationship you have with your colleagues, although you're not their boss. Uh, they do depend on you a great deal. They depend on you to be the catalyst for the spirit of the show. You know, your, vo your voice is the first thing the audience hears. Um, you might be the first image of the circus that they see. And also, um, you are really the person who sets the tone for how the show will um, be conducted uh, for the rest of the evening or morning or whenever we're performing. And you're also the you're also the first line of defense when uh, things go awry. Um, people look to you, uh, whether it's a critical accident, whether it's a, a technical mishap. They look to you to fill in the fill in that space to keep the fantasy alive as much as possible, so the audience doesn't know any better. So you said, um, I want to roll back slightly in, what, in, your, in your answer. You said, um, set the tone for the show. How does one go about doing that? What, what do you do to set the tone? You know, everything is energy, um, you know, and 
it's you know you you gauge yourself based on um really every audience you meet and every audience is different um obviously the it, it doesn't take a genius set tone at a circus there's only one tone really and that is excitement <laughs> it, <laughs> it, and it's it, and it's being as thrilling as possible um you know you're there to take people away so it doesn't matter if you're on a third show saturday and you had a few meet and greets in between shows or you had a PR uh, event uh, to attend, the fact of the matter is when that curtain opens and that light hits you, um, people are there to be taken away. And so you set the energy for the show. And it's very important, you know, I mean, out of your lips, from your mouth, um, these dynamic talents are introduced to the world. And so... um, you know, without you, it doesn't happen. And that's a powerful position to be in. in the yeah. Until you speak, nothing happens. And how you say it really tips the audience off as to how they should reference the particular talents they're seeing. So in my mind, for the min- few minutes those talents are out there, uh, for the hours that the show is occurring, we are giving audiences something otherworldly, ethereal, if you will. Um, That's what they're coming for. They're coming for miracles. They're coming for the extraordinary, the impossible, the science of miracles, the theater of the impossible. That's what they're there for. And you, the ringmaster, are the one responsible for seducing them into believing that that's exactly what they're getting. That's amazing. I love that. That that is such such a great explanation. Of, of what the role is. Um, I want to come back to, to talking about uh, three show days and all the events, but, but jumping farther back into your history, what brought you to arts in the first place? Uh, vanity. Pure vanity. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, everybody wants to be famous, what have you. But really, it, it, it started out with my deep desire to travel the world. I grew up in New York City, a wonderful neighborhood in New York City on Central Park West, and so I was around a lot of diversity and a lot of different types of people. And as a child, you become curious. I want to know where these people are from. I want to know what's on the other side of the world. Um, and having the imagination that I did, that's what I wanted to do. And as uh, I guess the law of attraction would have it, I saw this um, fascinating boy choir on the evening news. And I just kept going, my goodness, these kids look like me. They're probably knuckleheads just like me. What makes them so much better than me? And I found that it was the world-famous Boys Choir of Harlem, and they weren't too far from me. They were only a few uh, subway stops away from me. So my mother um, uh, got me an audition, and I went up there, and I auditioned, and I got in, and I thought, okay, my life is set now. I'm ready to get on a plane. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, (laughs) I I found out very quickly that... uh, you know, I had actually worked. Um, this wasn't, you know, show choir. This wasn't, you know, church choir. This was like serious semi-professionals, if anything, professionals, I'd say. I mean, these young men, they were on stages at the White House and on stages with some legendary uh, notable people, me singing before heads of stage, traveling the world. So you really had to know your stuff. You really had to, to become a um, uh, you had to earn those positions. And um, I tell you, as long as 18 months of my young life, wanted to quit every two days. My mother weaponized no, said no, you're not. You never know. You're going to keep going. And um, I'm very happy that she did just that. She didn't acquiesce to my whining and my uh, my uh, my inclination to mediocrity. Um, she, she pushed me to continue on. And as a result, it, it changed my life. It changed my life. I mean, at 13, I hit the road and I never looked back. I, I went to major on major tours. Um, it was the first time I left the country. And what a great way to start by going to Japan. And I went there for about a good month. And it was just so life changing and it was so rewarding. And um, I promised myself since that I'm going to go back one of these days. And I tell you, I mean, I, I you know, I, so even Japan and 
during my career with the Boys Choir of Harlem, I went to so many places, got to perform with so many dynamic people and before so many fantastic uh, historical figures, even Nelson Mandela, when he was released from prison, um, I was there singing for him. Um, you know, I met four presidents. I performed in the White House twice. Uh, you know, met the late, great uh, Dizzy Gillespie, um, you know, before he passed away. You know, uh, I just so many wonderful adventures. And then I had the audacity to go to Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts, the fame school, you know. And uh, boy, what an adventure that was. I mean, that that was beautiful girls who were extraordinarily talented. So that upped the ante for me even more. So I would be in Spanish class one day in Spain the next week. And it was a school that was accommodating to my life with the Boys Choir of Harlem. So it enhanced everything I wanted to do. Um, it was the greatest. I just had, I really had a great, I, I had a wonderful ride as a teenager. I, I would wish my teen years on anybody. It was so wonderful, so busy, so fruitful, um, just so much fun. Um, and I just had so many great adventures from it. And, uh, you know, it really opened my eyes to just how wonderful and big this world is. It, it, but it gave me that great lesson early on in life that um, if you want something, you know, you can have it, but you got to work for it. And sometimes you can work very hard and not always get it, but you have to really endure. And um, I was really proud of myself for enduring that because the rewards that I got being in the Boys Choir of Harlem were just unprecedented, unprecedented. So for, for how long were you in the Boys Choir of Harlem? I would say it was about, um, I was, a, I started at 11 and when I graduated at 18 from high school. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And you were 22 when you came to Ringling? Yes, I was. So I went, it was amazing. I went from the boys choir, I went straight to college, uh, at the University of Hartford, Hart School of Music, studied under a magnificent opera singer by the name of, uh, Jerome Pruitt. Uh, he was a fantastic tenor. Um, he had a major career in Europe, and he was a wonderful instructor, wonderful, masterful teacher, and a wonderful gentleman as well. And um, literally right out of college, <laughs> maybe I would say a good six months after I graduated, I, I was rewarded the uh, role of ringmaster, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. That's amazing. So you you... You left college, you went to Ringling, um, you started working on the train. How long was the transition before between getting the job and being on the train doing doing those kind of, of heavy load weeks? Um, it wasn't very long, to be quite frank. I was actually, um, I, I remember I did the, uh, the dinner theater gig, so I was hired for that. And, um, you know, that was just to keep me performing and ready, get me some money. And um, from that, I, I actually left that contract early to go and start rehearsals with Ringling Brothers, which is something very common in show business. Um, you know, you you have to go where your opportunities are. And so uh, they were very kind. The Klopsik family who owns the uh, the Five Side Dinner Theater, they were they were very kind to uh, allow me out of that contract to go and you know uh, take advantage of this moment in my life. And um, you know, when I first started, I was in the, I was in hotels for about a week or so uh, during rehearsals, and then I moved into the train, which is like a mile long, and I had um, a wonderful stately bachelor pad. Uh, you know, I, I like to say, you know, it was like a neighborhood. It's a city without a zip code, and so I was up in, I was in the, I was in the suburbs. I was in the gated community with the management, <laughs> you know, uh, and so um, it was lovely. It's the best way to travel best way to see the country yeah i've, I've been on I've, I've toured the circus train a couple of times and and seen the the different communities and, and and how they're housed and so on and that sounds that sounds pretty great definitely better than two to a buck um, <laughs> yeah. um so so you you transitioned over to ringling um what how many shows a week were you doing when you started out i would say the average week was about nine to eleven shows Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had press junkets and so on. 
uh, thrown in the mix, all those as well. A great deal of those. In fact, there was a run where I was, um, a run of a few weeks where I, I was literally flying to um, the city that we were going to open it up in. I was flying there instead of going on a train uh, for advanced press, you know. Um, so it was like running for, <laughs> it felt like I was running for office uh, in, in many respects. It was just this strange adventure. It was a whirlwind. Um, it really was. There was a lot of natural news. There was a lot of local news, a lot of newspapers and uh, TV junkets and uh, radio, which I love. I really love radio a lot because they let you be a little edgy. Um, and that was a little fun, you know. Um, so your instrument is your voice. Yes, it how is. Do you, how do you care for that when you're doing that many shows a week and that much extraneous, you know, extra spoken work on top of on top of your show work how do you keep yourself in in performing form i appreciate the question um you know first and foremost you have to start with a uh, a platform you have to start with a foundational base i would not recommend that job to anyone who really you know no matter how talented they may be naturally if you don't have some sort of um training going in uh it's not going to sit well for you I've known people who blew out their voices because they just didn't know what they were doing. You know, they may have had a nice tone or they were good announcers for their little show somewhere yonder. But um, this is a, uh, you're doing 400 and 400 plus shows a year plus press junkets. Um, it, it's a lot. And uh, I learned, too. You know, I, I had to learn the hard way because I was trying to be a rock star and a ringmaster. You can't do that. Um, you know, I was enjoying being 22 and <laughs> enjoyed the nightlife. And you can't. You, I had to make a decision. Um, I paid for it. And um, once I learned the lesson, I didn't do it again. Uh, the reality is I was very fortunate. I'd always had great vocal training. Um, I learned in the, uh, the, the classical style, the bel canto style. I learned how to really um, lean on my body to sing and not my throat. Um, and I had a lot of performing experience behind me. And so there are things you just learn doing it, you know, that you just can't in the studio. And so I had a lot of uh, work study experience as a, as a child to my adulthood. So I was prepared in that sense. Um, and there were other challenges I had to just learn to adjust to because life is that way. I had to learn to adjust to being around um, different types of exotic animals, some of whom I was allergic to. I had to learn oh. about, about being in dusty arenas that aren't necessarily the cleanest. Um, in truth, I was in a singer's nightmare. You know, um, yeah. there's all this mist and smoke and um, a lot of things. And then you're, you're dealing with uh, weather changes. You know, maybe one week you're in sunny Florida and then the next week you're in 30 degree weather in New York. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's you have to learn how to do you have to learn how to um, make adjustments. So um, being in that kind of environment was really rewarding because not only did I bring my own fundamentals, but there were things I just learned uh, on the job that, you know, I had to just build certain stamina. I just had to build certain things I had to uh, equip myself with in order to make the best of it uh, uh, in that run, in that in that career. Um, so, you know, I would, of course, I would vocalize. Um, I would also physically exercise um, because I'm singing for my body. And so the more energy I had, the better I felt, um, the better I would be able to use my voice. Um, you know, things like that, just basics. It wasn't complicated. You know, I drank a lot of fluids, water mainly. Um, there were certain kind of specific singers type of little tricks that I learned and things that I would do. And this lasted my entire career. I was always learning something new because the environments were always changing. Um, for example, it was always amazing to me. I would go to Raleigh, North Carolina, 
around January, February. And for some reason, my voice would just dry out. It was, there was this, this sharp dryness in that particular city that just would just dry me out. And I would barely make it through the run or I wouldn't make it at all. And I would have to call them out in the study because my voice would just dry out. Um, and that's the things you're, you're dealing with. Um, you're, you're going against the elements. You know, you're going against animals who are the stars of that show. They're not going to replace them. So <laughs> you have to learn how to adjust. Um, I'm sure I had every allergy pill known to man. Um, I became well, well acquainted with my uh, ear, nose, and throat specialists uh, throughout the country, um, all of whom would look at me like I was out of my mind when I told them what my schedule was like. Um, but, you know, it, it's really about the proper care and, and maintenance of your instrument, um, getting the proper rest, uh, not overeating, um, you know, keeping a, 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 a consistent uh, fitness schedule um, and, you know, really the act of performing itself, just activity really in many ways keeps you well. You find ways to sort of, I hate using this word, but you can say cheat a little bit where, you know, you're not always giving 100%. You can give 70 and it's actually good enough, you know, um, and you know, because you have to pace yourself. You you really do, because it is such a thrilling experience to go out there, to have all of those bodies and all of those people just raising their voices and swinging the the you know the glow lights and all of the souvenirs and people are just on the edge of their seats because the show matters so much to them. You can get caught up in that and, and hurt yourself if you're not careful because you're excited too. You know, and um, so you just have to know how to pace yourself. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so, I've, I've discussed this many times with people about circus arts is that we don't perform, uh, most circus performers, ones who are doing tricks, it's one, don't perform at 100% because that's just, that's where you make mistakes. That's where you drop balls. That's where people fall. You perform at 70%. You know what yeah. your skill level is. You know what you can do. And you don't push that, you perform at 70%. As you push your skill level higher and higher, so 70% looks like what 100% looks like last month. But, um, but you, you, you keep it, you keep yourself safe and keep each other safe by performing a step back from your, from your maximum output. Well, so all the greats say that. All, it's so funny, you know, the great, uh, the great opera singer, Liam Team Price used to say, you know, you sing on your interest, not on your capital. And so, nice. You know, as a professional, you learn that. I mean, that's really in everything. I've heard even boxers say that. You know, you fight on your your interests, meaning what, for them the language was you don't. You, you know, the less punishment you take, the better off you are. And so I think that that's relatable and transferable to uh, uh, to everything else. Um, the the idea is to you want to play off your interests. You don't want to damage the principle or the capital of of your uh, your um your your abilities you want to keep that as strong as possible to anchor the interest so you yeah yes absolutely um you mentioned having an understudy because i was going to ask you that you're out there pressing the flesh you're doing meet, meet and greets you're doing press junkets you're you're interacting with so many other human beings plus all the people in your yes. circus community you got to be getting sick uh <laughs> how do how do you deal with that when you know you're in this I was, kind of pressure I tell you that it's interesting. I, I think um, I either I developed or I, I just always had a very strong immune system. So I never really could say I ever got sick. Um, but, you know, it, it's strange. My, You know, the voice just I would be in an environment that I didn't adequately prepare for or I didn't know about. It was just so new. And, or, you know, I remember for years I dealt with reflux which just, you know, that acid jumping on your throat. Um, and that was something. I remember my first year, I had, <laughs> I, I call it the, the super whammy. I had, and, and this was completely my fault because, again, I was trying to live like a rock star. I was literally going out at night, staying out all night, hanging out, uh, you know, with people who could afford to blow their voices out. Um, you know, trying to enjoy the nightlife and chase some girl. <laughs> and, I, you know, my I gained weight. 
I reflux caught up with me. I wasn't mindful of my environment, meaning the allergies and the allergens and things like that. So it was like a, a, a just a culmination of events. And I went to my ear, nose and a specialist. My voice had just given out. And he, you know, they have this tool where they actually look through your, go through your nasal cavity down to your throat with a camera. And my throat was swollen. It looked purple. And um, I had this wonderful ear, nose and throat specialist in New York City. This guy literally saw everybody in the industry. I mean, he saw the pictures and he was, he was so good. He didn't take insurance. You paid him in cash. <laughs> and um, he, he told me, he said, okay, you need to shut up for like two weeks. I said, but you know, they have a recording of me where I can lip sync if I want. He said, no, I don't even want you to, right now. I said, I said, I don't even want you moving your lips. He said, cause this is, and it was, it, it just was, I mean, it was swollen. So I had reflux. I had allergies. Um, you know, there was a lot of inflammation of the throat and a lot of it had to do with just not really taking care of myself as best as I could. And, um, you know, I fortunately, and this was right before we were supposed to do the world premiere in New York. So I was out for about three weeks and I came back in time enough to open in Madison Square Garden, fortunately. And thank God it was such an exhilarating experience. There's nothing like playing the garden. And that's where I'm from. Oh, my goodness. It was just heavenly, you know. And it was very emotional for me. I just really enjoyed the experience. And um, I never took it for granted again. And so I recovered, got better, voice got stronger. And I really, that's when I really understood pacing, pacing. And I really started becoming exceedingly mindful of my environment. Um, you know, what kind of things I could take to keep my, uh, system, my immune system strong, Certain people will stay away from, you know, who, you know, who probably weren't going to be any good for me. Um, but of course, the uh, company did employ um, an understudy, somebody who kind of mirrored me. Um, and it, it, it was a challenge for them because, you know, they weren't me. So, you know, the person might like they would sing to my track and then they would make announcements or something like that. Oh. Until they, and then, you know, that's what they would do the first couple of years. And then eventually they brought in people who, you know, they could sing themselves. They could do that. Um, let's say it was a, a wonderful young man by the name of Andre McLean, who they, uh, who would become our really, he became really well known as our, um, pre show host. Uh, he's the third generation cowboy and everything. So he, he, you know, he would, get everybody going, riled up for the, the opening, the pre-show. And then, um, you know, he would introduce me and on with the show. But occasionally he would step in for me and, um, you know, do the show. And so he could sing and he could announce and he has a wonderful, nice baritone voice. And so he would step in and eventually, you know, we groomed him enough where he would also have his own shows. And so, and that was great for him, and, and it was wonderful to see him uh, move on like that. But, um, you know, you, the show must go on. You, you come up with all sorts of ways to uh, really maintain yourself, because at the end of the day, the target, the, the main thing is producing and, and, and creating a wonderful show for people to escape with. That's gorgeous. That's wonderful. Um, so going back to your your foundations as an artist, um, who who are the artists that inspire you? Who do you who do you draw upon for your work? Oh wow! Thank you for asking that. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's plenteous, man. Um, first and foremost, when I was in the boys' choir, problem, I mean, you wouldn't know these singers, but you know, m many of my peers there, the talent in that group was just really. I mean, absolutely world class. Kids like me, but they were world class. Um, some of the most beautiful voices I ever heard in my life. And some of the most really astonishing performers I ever saw in my life. It started there. Um, and I can see them now. I mean, just as teenagers, they just had so much talent. 
and um, you know, some of the most beautiful. Vo- I'm talking voices that would just tear you up and break your heart. Uh, it started there, and so if you can imagine, I was around that all the time, all the time, traveling with that and just feeding off of that, and being in that community where mediocrity was frowned upon, and we were knuckleheads. But, you know, there was this beautiful uh, fraternity of song among us, and there was a lot of support. Um, you know, early on, people saw my promise, and, um, you know, my peers were very protective of me. Uh, some of the older guys, they would challenge me in a wonderful way, you know, try this, do this, and they would give me tips and show me things. And I've always, I've, I've always been a student, always been a student, so that's why my... Uh, bevy or array of, uh, I have a cavalcade of, uh, idols, if you will. The first really, I think, popular singer that just stole my heart was Placido Domingo. And I saw him in Japan when I was touring with the Boys Choir of Harlem. And that experience really just shattered me because it was so, it, 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 it told me that's what I, that's what I am. He was so magnificent. Just came and sang a song, but it was just like I just I'd never heard of him, and it was the first time I I heard a human voice do that, like at that level. Um, and then after that, you know, I started really after him. I think I really started listening. I had music in my life, my whole life. You know, I grew up in church, so you're always gonna have music. But I mean, that's when I really started listening. Really started listening, and um, so of course it was him, and it was a array of the wonderful great opera singers uh uh mario lanza uh uh mario del monaco uh franco carelli um of course luciano pavarotti um you know uh juicy burling um alain vanzo uh john vickers um there's a uh there's, of course, in the pop genre and the R&B genre, of course, the great Stevie Wonder and Brian McKnight and, of course, the Kings, uh, Sam Cooke and Donny Hathaway. And um, as I got older, it was, you know, Nancy Wilson, uh, uh, um, Patti LaBelle. Um, oh, and, of course, the divine Sarah Vaughan, who is my favorite singer of all time. Um Johnny Hartman, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Mel Torne, you know, even Sammy Davis Jr., who is cruelly underrated as a singer. Um, just so many. And I mean, there are probably others I'm missing. Donnie Hathaway. Oh, good Lord. Donnie Hathaway. There's a great singer, uh, Daryl Coley, gospel singer. Um, you know, Tremaine Hawkins, um, Whitney Houston, you know, all the, I mean, just, uh, just, there's so many different, Types of singers who, and of course, the divine Luther Vandross, man. How could I, I, good Lord, man. I met Luther Vandross and I, I, I you know, I, I became a, I became a teenage girl, you know, it was just so funny because yeah, he was just so, he meant so much to me growing up. I mean, just hearing how and watching how he, you know, I, I had the great fortune of seeing Luther Vandross perform uh, live as well as Luciano Pavarotti. But this had to be very divine because I had, so we were actually performing with, well, we, we performed the intermission, that is the Boys Choir of Harlem, at Luciano Pavarotti in Central Park. And I was about 18 years old, and I was like, we were literally in the front, we were sitting at the stage. So this was a remarkable master class. This was the ultimate master of song. And to see him that way, like, and to even kind of understand what he was doing was just breathtaking. And I had the same experience when I was on the road with Circus. Um, I had the opportunity to go see a Luther Vandross concert. And I had the fortune of actually watching him from backstage and just watching the mechanics of how he worked, the science of he really, he, 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 he had a similar technique to Luciano Pavarotti where he used his voice as an instrument. And there wasn't much strain. You know, it comes across as big and powerful, but when you see what they're doing, it, it's really like it's they, they know how to get to their sweet spot as, as singers. And I said, man, that's where you want to go. That's what you want to do. And, and the, he really knew his voice as well as, of course, the great Luciano. 
And um, I always look for singers like that who are really master technicians, but not just master technicians, but like the great Frank Sinatra, they're storytellers. Because if you're not telling a story, it, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. Wow. That's, that's a lot of amazing influences. Um, I want to talk to you now about um, what you're doing now. Yes. Um, so we've talked about your past a lot and, and what brought you here and the people who who helped uh, influence who you were. Um, tell me about, is it is it called Omniversal? Omnium, yes. Sir. Omnium, Omnium, sorry. Yes. Omnium. No? Tell, me, tell me about Omnium. I, oh, it's beautiful. Omniumcircus.org. I want everybody to visit. Omniumcircus.org. It's a non-for-profit. Uh, it was established this year in the middle of, well, actually uh, a little bit last year by uh, the wonderful Lisa B. Lewis. Um, it's been a dream of hers. And like so many people during the pandemic, they just decided, look, I'm going to dust these <laughs> dreams off the shelf and I might as well do it. And she, she happened upon it. I was honored that she welcomed me to uh, the board of directors and that she um, would ask me to um, fill in as ringmaster as well. Um, it's an extraordinary um, company in that we're expanding the umbrella of uh, inclusion in circus and not in a hokey uh, tokenism type of way. Um, we're still about the high standard that circus is always set because at the end of the day, that's what it's always been about. And quite frankly, you know, as you know, watching the events that occurred last summer, a lot of the protests, a lot of demonstrations about inclusion, about race and all those things, circus is in many ways has been on the forefront of that before it was a thing, you know? Um, we look back in women's rights, you know, when we look at women in the circus, they were already at that place that the suffragists were trying to get to. So it was kind of a natural movement. But even the circus itself um, has had to deal with its own uh, very human uh, mishaps as well when it comes to uh, especially issues of race and things like that. And we, of course, had wonderful conversations during the pandemic uh, uh, presented by a, a wonderful platform I hope everybody enjoys called Circus Talk. Circus Talk, uh, they presented so many extraordinary, they just have so much incredible content. They're a, a hub for circus content, jobs, events, you name it. Um, and so I'm a part of, I, I work with them a great deal. I moderate some of those conversations and I write for them as well. It's a great, great um, uh, online platform. But um, Omnium kind of, in many ways is really, uh, it's, it's, that, it's that hope in action. And so we're, we're not just about being multiracial and, of course, uh, diverse in gender, but we're also about the, the multi-bodies, you know, the multi-able bodies. And so you have extraordinary talents, um, of course, like the great Jen Bricker, you know, um, a lot of people, some, you know, she's known as this fantastic aerialist. She's an author. She speaks all over the world. And, um, you know, she's toured with Britney Spears, done various shows all over the world. And she's a part of Omnium as well. She was born with no legs. And she was put up for adoption um, as a baby. And she grew up in this extraordinary family that told us she can never say the word can't. And so she grew up with this great level of confidence. I mean, she is a killer athlete, like literally. I mean, just an incredible, incredible athlete. And her attitude toward life is just brilliant. And it's not just her. There are so many other acts that are just really wonderful. And, they, they, you know, they're showing the, the, just the extraordinary uh, power and beauty of the human experience. Um you know, from so many perspectives, you know, whether you're deaf, whether you're, you know, you're infirmed in some way that there are no limits, really. Um, and so Omnium is really about expanding that umbrella, welcoming people in. I mean, even if you see our virtual offering that we debut, which was expanded by popular demand to April 4th. Um, if you again, if you go on OmniumCircus.org, you'll be able to see the program we presented, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful program with artists from all over the world. Um, and of course, it was much easier to facilitate that from a virtual space, but it's really well done. 
Um, and you get to really just see just uh, the, the dynamic diversity and, you, and, it, and it welcomes everybody. And, you know, we, we have uh, platforms on the, sh on the uh, presentation that are for, um, you know, those who are deaf. So we have sign language, we have um, closed captioning, we have a lot of different ways you can experience the show if you can't hear, if you're blind, whatever the case may be. But we, again, we've expanded this tent to really attract people of, of, of every age, every ability, every background to really enjoy uh, what it is to be a part of a circus. And, and so that's, that's the vision of Omnium and it's growing. Um, we're finding success. We're getting some grants and sponsorships. I mean, and it's shocking considering we're in this pandemic and, you know, we don't know what's going to be of live entertainment. Of course, we're going to come back, but we know it's going to be modified. I mean, those conversations obviously are happening right now in the uh, in the um, uh, cinematic space. You know, we see the the uh, uh, the emergence of all of these streaming services. Paramount just came out with its own streaming service, Disney Plus, Netflix, Hulu, all these different streaming services. So more and more now we're seeing that, you know, uh, maybe the movie houses won't be as prolific as they once were. And now we have these streaming service. You know, it's just amazing how everything pivots and how people adjust. Um, and, I, and I think that's going to be the case with just everything, even the workspace. I've been talking to friends of mine who've been working from home for over a year and they've been told, you know, basically they may not go back to the office. Like maybe the offices will close down because productivity is up and maybe the office will be used as for administrative uh, uh, matters. But, you know, you know, if you're in a certain industry, yeah, it's probably just better if you're at home. And so who knows, you know, there are a lot of changes I, I foresee coming when we get out of this. And I think Omnium is going to be a part of that. Um, we're definitely going to have a live presentation uh, coming soon, um, which we're looking forward to. We're going, we're going to tour. Um, and it's the kind of um, organization that allow us to tour uh, internationally as well, which was one of my only regrets when I was with Ringling Brothers. The, fa the, the, the father side went was Mexico. Um, with them, but I always wanted to travel internationally, so I'm looking forward to that. And yes, we do present animals as well. We have we featured the the, the, the just the charming Jenny Vidbell um, of the Al and Joyce Vidbell Foundation. Uh, she is legendary. Her family's legendary in the circus world. Her animal husbandry, and she features her beautiful horses. Uh, in our virtual presentation. So we're, we have, you know, everything is represented. It's your classic circus, but expand it. And I love, I love the way you phrase that, expanding the tent to allow more people in, to allow more people to be part of, of this world that we love so much. Uh, yes. That's incredibly cool. Um, so on the internet or wherever, where can people find you and your work? Thank you so much. You can find me at last ringmaster at last ringmaster and you can find me on facebook instagram now tiktok they dragged me on there, <laughs> um clubhouse too i got dragged into that um did i say twitter yeah twitter um i you know i've been trying to lay off of social media but they keep pulling me back in um, and of course my website is uh big top and that reminds me i better make sure i, I I have to make sure I pay for the hosting. <laughs> <Because> I, <laughs> I know those fears. What happened? So I have to make sure that's up. But um, you can always reach me there. Um, and and I, I, I always interact with my fans as, uh, and friends as much as I can. Um, I mean, it's been the way we've been communicating. It's how I, I had the pleasure of uh, running into you, sir. Yes. Uh, so um, it, it's, it's wonderful. And I think it's just, I think it, it's been an interesting gift. You know, because it's allowed more people to connect in a way across, you know, across the world. You know, I've, it was, somebody told me, I actually did some work for um, the, okay, I want to get this right. It was the Australian, it was a circus festival recently. And it was all the way out in Australia. But, you know, they, they requested I um, do a couple of uh, 
you know, int- uh, introductions and things like that. And I was so happy to do it. You know, that was out in Australia. I did a favor for a, a gentleman out in, I think, Scotland for his show. And I'm just, I, I just, I'm just loving the idea of being able to have such reach. That's an advantage. Of course, I'd love to be there in person. I love to travel. I still have the wanderlust. So, um, that, that's still there, but, um, you know what? I, I think we're, we're doing well with what we have. That's wonderful. All right. Last question before I let you go. And thank you. It's been <laughs> a wonderful conversation. Um, if you could tag one other person to be on the podcast after you, who would it be? Oh, if I can tag one other person to be on a podcast, after you, you know, who you should talk to is the glorious, wonderful Shania Booth. Shania, Shania Stiletto Booth. Booth. Yeah. She's a fantastic, uh, um, hand balancer and she comes from a just a celebrated background as a um a, a gymnast uh, athletic gymnast she's actually a, a multi-world champion she's uh in the hall of fame she's a very young woman too and she's a, a, a dynamic activist um you know for a, a lot of you know victims of sexual assault and things like that and she's a great voice in that but she's also just charming and entertaining and fun and um she's on many platforms she hosts a podcast of her own called um live like an acrobat it's a wonderful podcast and um you know i hope everybody tunes into it um so shanea booth uh Shania 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 stiletto that's her that's Shania her statement. stiletto okay yes great yes. that's wonderful uh jonathan thank you so much for being with us and um best of luck with omnium and everything going forward Thank you for having me, and remember, keep the circus alive inside you. We will. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. You take care, my friend. Thank you for joining us today on Ridiculous Life of a Clown. This program, as always, is made possible by your support through our Patreon, which you can find through www.picklewater.com. Theme song by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech Music.